Thank you, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, first off, I, uh, I've been in Harrisburg 35 years. I've seen transportation bills come and go. And I've seen uh, uh, the reason why uh, representatives don't vote or won't vote for, uh, for a, a, a complex, what they consider a complex bill. Okay? Uh, I was the chairman of the uh, insurance committee for 20 years, and when the uh, transportation committee chairmanship opened up, uh, being the most senior member on in the House of Representatives, I decided that it's important that we, in the Southeast, have a representative who represents uh, the area, one of the areas in the Southeast. Because it's very important for our five county area, as Bob had alluded to this morning, uh, the importance, the importance of us having a, a transportation system that lends to economic growth. Um, so I've been the chairman about three weeks. Uh, I've been on the transportation committee about maybe uh, six months or something like that. But I do know, I do know what the problems are with transit. I do know that the bridges and the roads are deteriorating and have been deteriorating for many, many years. All you have to do is travel the turnpike, travel the under the bridges of SEPTA, and you can see what I'm talking about. Okay? So where are we right now? Okay? Uh, when a representative or a senator wants to vote against a bill, they can find every excuse in the world. Now it's prevailing wage, no, I don't want to raise. I don't want to raise uh, the gas tax because when I run, my opponent will have uh, have brochures, negative brochures. I've been through every negative campaign for the last 34 years. Before that, I was an Upadari councilman, and I know what negative campaigns can do to you. But if you do your job, you knock on doors and do all the things you're supposed to do. Uh, pay raise. On the pay raise, I got four phone calls when I voted for the pay raise. Uh, my fingers almost dropped off when I had to send the money back. But anyway, <laughs> so, so where are we with it today? Uh, when I first got elected, I mean, to point it to the chairmanship, uh, I know many of the union members, uh, the leaders. And I called Pat Gillespie, my good friend, who, who once was a state rep in the 70s, or early 80s, and he had put together a agreement with some of the unions, but eventually it fell apart. And it seems to be the period of wage is the most, the most important thing. The other, the other area we we're working on is to make sure that there's a, not a negative impact uh, on, the, on the consumer. Uh, registration, it started with 30, we paid $36, and two, two years would be on $4. So what we're trying to do is to make make the bill such that we can give more and more votes. Right now, uh, there's a lot of negotiations going on between our Democratic leadership and the Republican leadership, and there's a lot of progress. And at least they're working together and talking together. Uh, transit, transit funding is the most important part of this negotiation. Um, I think Senate Bill 1 has something like 480 million or something like that. Uh, so there's negotiations going there. I can assure you, myself and the negotiating team are doing everything we can to, do, to get this done. If we don't do this in the next eight, eight or 10 days, we go back to 12. If we don't do that in the 10 day sessions left, you can forget about it because next year you will not get the votes in the General Assembly. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. If I just get a call about traffic conditions, I could get here on time. <laughs> um, well, look, from the, from the administration's perspective, I think the governor's been quite clear in the last couple of weeks. He's willing to move to whatever conditions that, that the chairman just described or negotiated and signed. 
a bill. He wants to get a bill on his desk, and as Nick said, it needs to get on his desk in this session. He knows it. Uh, I think you all know it. Um, and he is strongly supportive of this issue. He is uh, crisscrossing the state right now uh, in person and via media uh, to push this issue and make sure that the legislature understands that he is willing to compromise. Uh, and his perspective on this is that when he introduced this plan, uh, the administration plan with the budget last year, it was a $1.8 billion plan. Multimodal, uh, but $1.8 billion. And in the discussions with the, the leadership uh, in the House on both sides, and I want to give a lot of credit to the leadership and the chairman of both sides of this, because without Frank Dermody and Sam Smith uh, and the two chairmen and the leadership sitting down and getting engaged, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now, frankly, uh, because the House never really got engaged in negotiating a bill like the Senate did. Um, and last June, when we didn't get any work with the budget uh, process on transportation, uh, there really was no significant dialogue within the House. And to the credit of Frank Dermody and, and uh, Sam Smith, they said, you know, we need to have that dialogue and do exactly what the chairman just described, which is try to get a bill that can get through the House. Uh, Senate Bill 1 got through the Senate, 45 to 5, we all know that. But that exact bill, had it run in the House, would have failed, for different reasons, but it would have failed. And so there needed to be a dialogue about how do you maximize the amount of votes in the House. And uh, that's been going on for the last, uh, month, six weeks. And you might say, gee, why didn't it happen? You know, we, we had hoped it was gonna happen in a vote a couple weeks ago, but the reality was they were telling us, look, we're not quite there yet. And uh, the governor and I sat in a meeting with them, listened to where they were and said, okay, but when you come back, get there. That's what the governor's message was, uh, was when you come back next time, be there, be ready to vote, be ready to vote on a bill that you believe has the best chance uh, to get out of the House, uh, get to a compromise discussion with the Senate and get to his desk. And I will say, beyond the House negotiations that's going on, we have the four caucus leaders meeting. So the Senate leaders are involved in being updated on what's changing from Senate Bill 1 to the House bill, so that there's not a surprise and then a stalemate between what the House might pass and what the Senate might pass. We don't want that to occur either. Um, so, you know, I think the administration's perspective is the, the governor has said, I'm willing to move from 1.8 billion to as high as the 2.5 billion that came out of Senate Bill 1. I'm willing to look at a, you know, Senate Bill 1 had a three-year uncap. Uh, the House <coughs> and the administration said five-year. He said, I'm willing to do either. And what he said to the union leaders when they were in the room is, look, to get this done, everybody might need to move a little bit. I'm willing to move. The Senate appears to be willing to move downward a little bit from their 2.5 million number. The House leadership uh, appears to be willing to move up from where they were last summer at 2 billion to somewhere in the middle. And you know his message to the unions is that, that some movement might need to occur on prevailing wage. He didn't, and I want to stress this, it wasn't as though he said, it's my issue, I'm asking you to do it. It came out of discussions saying, we need to talk about it. And it may very well be that there may, might need to be some movement in that regard. So his perspective on it is that everybody uh, should be willing to move enough to compromise to get a bill out. Uh, and, and from his perspective, it's about public safety, it's about the economy, it's about jobs. And if we can't all move a little bit, then we're walking away from those three very important issues. And our perspective of the administration is if, it walk, if, if the answer is we're going to walk away from it, the consequences will continue. Uh, because for all of us in this room, every single one of us, no matter what we do for a living, we know that every action we take, there's benefits and there's consequences of whatever we decide to do. And the consequences on the transportation side are we'll post about another 250 bridges next year because they're going to continue to age onto the system and age and become more weak. Between state and local government, we'll probably increase the postings of another 250. And on the public transportation side, you've heard from SEPTA about what their forecasts are. We have about seven lines that are not funded uh, any further than somewhere this fall into next spring, things like uh, the Philly Flash down here in Philadelphia. Uh, there's a number of other lines in, in the region that will run out of funding. It'll put about 50,000 people a month out of the transcribe. And then in Pittsburgh, we have the Port Authority Agreement that we negotiated uh, where it requires a $30 million infusion of state funding every year. We were very clear when we negotiated that a year ago that we had that money for year one. We did not have it for year two. We're in year two. We have $16 million left in, in a basically unsecured account one that the money is not pre-spent. And without it, um, we can fund the Port Authority through the end of the year, calendar year, and then the agreement reverts back to the old labor agreement, which will cause about 30% cuts in transit service in Pittsburgh. So I think it's a pretty stark comparison of where the governor sees this. Either 
we come to a compromise and we avoid those consequences and instead begin to invest and address these problems that, that the chairman talked about. Or, um, you know, we continue on the road of additional consequences. None of us want to see that, but it will be the reality, just like the reality of losing this construction season caused us to post the number of bridges we did to slow down the rate of deterioration. So I think you're going to hear more this week from the governor and from me as we both uh, are on some media tours across the state about the need to complete the negotiations that the chairman talked about this week and to come to town the following Tuesday when we come back in session ready to get a bill up to vote and get it through the process and get it on his desk. Because uh, I think the chairman is absolutely right. If it doesn't happen this time around, I don't know when we'll be talking about this again. It certainly won't be next year. Um, and the reality is for anyone who's concerned about politically about a potential 2.3 to 2.5 billion dollar spending bill, if it goes away for a couple of years, that won't be enough. The next time we'll be talking about three billion or three and a half billion. Every year, every year, and I've tried to liken this to a credit card with a very high balance on it and a very high interest rate. Every year we don't take action, you can add three hundred fifty million dollars to the backlog. It's about a million dollars a day of interest, if you will, meaning the system continues to age and the cost, the deferred cost of dealing with that problem is about three hundred fifty million a year. So if it doesn't get solved this time at a $2.5 billion, the next time the starting point is going to have to be three, uh, which just means you're going to be looking, as all the state reps here know, for even more fees and new taxes to add to the coffers, which just becomes more and more difficult. So this challenge, by putting it off, does not become easier. And that's why the governor, and he just said on the media the other day, he said, you know, I didn't run on this issue. Uh, he said I was somewhat happily uh, unknowing of the issue and the scope of the problem until I got into office. But uh, he said, when I got in here, um, I realized quite quickly this was something that putting it off isn't going to save any money, putting it off isn't going to solve any problems, putting it off is not going to make it any easier to deal with. And that's why he took it on. And it certainly was not something he campaigned on, something he didn't expect to deal with, but something that, like many things, when those of us who step into these roles, once you have the responsibility for it, then it's yours. And that's his perspective is, I'm responsible for it, uh, I may not have campaigned on it, but I'm a governor. And at this point, he is stressing and pushing for a compromise bill to get to his desk and get there this month. And hopefully, um, like I said, this every one of these meetings, I'm at every one of the speeches. Hopefully, the next time any of you invite me to speak, we'll be talking about what we'll be doing with the money instead of how much we need it. So that's the administration's perspective on where it is. I think I don't want to re uh, repeat what Nick said, but. Uh, Hopefully we'll have some uh, something up for vote next week, something that will be the, the best bill that can get the most votes in the House. And I'm confident that the negotiators are doing that. Meaning whether it passes or not, I'm confident that their objective is to get a bill that has the highest possible level of confidence before they're running out the floor. And that's a good thing. What was going to happen a month ago where we were going to run Senate Bill 1, run the Hess Amendment, and run a critical needs bill, that would have been check three boxes. We voted on three different things. They all failed move on. That wasn't acceptable. And that's when the governor stepped in and said that's not acceptable. So from the administration's perspective, it's moving in the right direction. Hopefully it will acquire the votes we need, the 102 votes we need in the House, and, and then get concurrence in the Senate. And uh, we'll be done with this discussion and move on. I, I want to talk a little bit about the individual legislator's perspective. And, and just to set it straight, I'm, I'm publicly in support of Senate Bill 1, which is the bill that passed the Senate, which is the highest number that uh, the Secretary mentioned. I was actually a front page story in the Times Herald above the fold and I did not get struck by lightning. <laughs> I tell people that to try to give my, my colleagues a little courage. I'd like to talk why this is not a layup as uh, Rob Wonderling said, although I wish it were. It's, it's what legislators refer to as a heavy lift. What's a heavy lift? Well, we're talking about raising prices at, at the pump. Um, we're talking about lifting the cap off the wholesale gas tax, which will surely be passed along to the, to the commuters and will surely raise gas prices. Now, the estimate is either $2 or $2.50 a week. Right now, we have a flat cents per gallon. As people drive more fuel efficient cars and um, uh, in a recession don't drive as much, you know, our gas taxes are not keeping pace with the needs that the secretary outlined. So we're talking about lifting the wholesale um, cap, wholesale tax cap, so it will go up. And we're also talking about raising registration fees for uh, cars and trucks. 
Now, why would that be a heavy lift for a legislator? First of all, the timing issue. Half of the Senate and all of the House are up for election next year. The House is never more than six months away from having had a bad experience or about to have a bad experience, you know, unless you live in what I refer to as dead squirrel territory. In, in dead squirrel territory, either Republican, usually rural, or Democrat, usually urban, you run uh, a dead squirrel on the right side of the ticket, it's going to get elected. But that's, this is not dead squirrel territory. Am I right, Tim? Right. So, so any House member is going to be worried about uh, the next election. And the next election, in case you don't know this, starts hmm, maybe the day after Tuesday, or at the latest, December, particularly for, for primary challenges. So people don't like a gas tax or raising registration fees because gas taxes are democratic with a small d. Everybody will feel it, it will be painful, and they will complain to us, what were you thinking? Registration fees are actually worse from the perspective of many of my colleagues because we do registration in Pennsylvania year round. So you're gonna have people mad at you all year round. Okay, so this is not a layup, it's a heavy lift. And the best way to do it is to get a bill that actually makes sense for all the various factions of uh, the House, if you want to get a bill through the House. So critical needs refers to the majority leader's idea that roads and bridges are, are what we need to do. But that's not going to get Democratic votes because Democratic areas tend to have a lot more mass transit and have to worry about that. So you have to balance the bill, make sure you have enough money for roads and bridges, enough money for mass transit, and that, that you can get votes. It's all about getting to 102 or 103 in the House, which has 203 people. So I'd like to urge all of you to talk to your own legislators and any legislators from nearby districts that you know, because you need to shore them up and get them to vote yes on this. I think we know how important this is. Um, but just think of it, once again, from the individual legislator's perspective. If a bridge doesn't fall down, there's no story on Action News. If a, if, if a bridge gets repaired before it falls down, there's usually no ribbon cutting for something like that. This doesn't happen. So from a legislator's point of view, you know, doing something hard when the payoff is not immediate or near term is a tough, is a tough, tough sell. But I think one of the things we learned from the Katrina disaster was that Louisiana should have spent more money for its levies. Okay? Why didn't they? Well, you know, if you wait until it starts raining to ask whether the levies are going to hold, you waited too long. And that's what Louisiana did, basically. They waited too long. And, and that's what I'm afraid that the legislature in Pennsylvania might do if we don't get this done right away. Because if we don't get it done right away, as the chairman said, there's nobody who's voting to make everybody mad at them during an election year. So uh, hopefully we'll get it done. Such a compromise, such a, a bipartisan, overwhelming support should be a no-brainer when it comes to the House, you would think. Um, spent the summer explaining to constituents at town hall meetings and, and forums why um, the House is a little bit different than the Senate. And I, I think it's probably a, a good um, background to give and then let you know, I, I do feel optimistic what has happened the last few weeks and then I'll explain why. Um, the House the last couple of years is uh, overwhelmingly Republican, 111 to 92 now. Um, most major issues that can get done in the House, um, Leader Terzai is an extreme, I think, in my eyes, um, right wing part of their, their caucus. Um, he, he responds to the Tea Party portion of the caucus more um, aggressively or, uh, than the rest of the, the moderates, as I think Kate and, and Nick are. Um, so most major issues that he is able to get out of the House, he can do on his own. He can do with Republican votes. This was probably the first time that June came that he was in a situation where something that I think the caucus wanted to do, he couldn't get the number of votes to, to get it done. And the, the history of lack of talking to the Democratic caucus, lack of trust, really exposed itself in June. Because the, the first meeting I was told of happened was, well, we need 70 Democrats to vote for this in order to get it done. Well, we weren't part of drafting it, we weren't part of discussing it, and that was the first conversation that I was told we had. 
Um, Barry, Barry might have been part of others, but, but that was the way it was dis displayed to us. Um, in transportation committee, it went from a 2.5 downwards um, to cutting mass transit funding um, significantly, I think down to 480 to 200 million. Um, there was a lot of pressure in those couple days to, to get something done. I think the Democrats did the right thing and, and resisted passing a, a weak bill and urged, you know, over the summer, Kate and I were at forums and she was telling me Dermody's got to not just say he wasn't at the table, he's got to bang his door down, bang the door down and get okay. to the table. I spent a lot of time traveling the state. I, I chaired the political arm of the Democratic caucus this cycle um, with Dermody to a lot of meetings. And every chance I had, I, I, I did try to convince him to, to do the right thing, be a leader, talk to whoever wants to talk to you. Terzai doesn't want to be part of the equation. He, he started reaching out to, I know Barry over the summer, um, Pelleggi, Scarnati, Jay Costa, and eventually Sam Smith, and he started talking more frequently. Our staffs have been talking. Um, about two weeks ago, I guess, they decided to pull the Senate in and have four caucus support. So in my eyes, we put leader Terzai, who is still a challenge here in, in the equation, he's still the leader of the Republican caucus, he's been removed from the process, which I think is a, is a positive step. The, the Tea Party, who are very loud against any of this, not they just don't want to vote no, they want to kill it, um, I think have been, up until recently, just, just vote no. If you, want to, if you want to vote no, just vote no. Don't do press conferences against it. Don't. Um, a dynamic happened in the last couple of weeks, couple of days, I guess. Uh, one of these groups is starting to do mailers against Kate and Nick's colleagues, more moderate Republicans, um, calling them the most liberal tax and spend Republicans in Harrisburg. Uh, that's, that's not good for the process. I think they will stand up and continue to do the right thing. Every two years, I get blamed for being the most liberal person in Harrisburg and taxing you know everything I can tax for. I still come back, you know, it doesn't. So we're gonna get blamed for it if it doesn't happen. People think they're taxed too much anyway. People think, Democrats especially, you know, we'll, we'll just tax, you know, tax and spend liberals. Um, as long as I think you can explain job creation, the safety issues, the important thing, how, how much this is, if this is fiscally responsible. If you don't do it this year, it's gonna cost more next year. Um, every time I, I, I do a newsletter, I talk about that. I, I really have been trying to talk about it for the last couple of years. And we, we've been, I think, as a caucus, responsible. So the last two weeks, we've been meeting. Um, the challenge is the 102. We don't have to get 190 votes. I mean, we have to get 102. And we're down to, my understanding, very limited number of issues that um, they're still working out. And it's a limited, I mean, it's, Barry could probably address it. It's, it's not many. Um, and there has to be a willingness to compromise a little bit. You, you know, we, we can say we want 2.5 billion total, 500 million mass transit. That's great as a, as a negotiating tool, but at the end of the day, we have to be able to vote on something that 102 people will vote on. Um, I still don't think that we should be putting up the Democrats the majority of the votes. I think it should be something um, reasonable and, and, uh, and 50-50 kind of numbers would be satisfying for me, but that's that's a decision that my leaders will make and and uh, try to count the votes. We, this isn't a popular, um, as Kate said, that, that putting up a 28 cent gas tax isn't isn't the most popular thing, but we just had a new Wawa open, and uh, first day, 10, 11 days ago, the gas was 3.30, I think. Now it's 3.13 or 3.15 in 10 days. They've been competitive, there's, there's some, there's some fluid fluidity in those numbers that uh, I hope um, can work in our favor at, at the right time.